Good morning, ladies. We are so thrilled that you are here. I just have to say that I'm really glad that y'all chose to get out of your pajamas and come today. Because am I right? I mean, I'm not the only one who was in my pajamas two full days without going anywhere. I hope I'm not the only one who did that. It was very nice. Maybe God just um, wanted us all to slow down a bit. Um, one of my friends even said maybe God needed to keep us separated a little bit so we wouldn't pass the flu around more and more. So anyway, we are glad that y'all are here today. We hope that you have been warm and toasty in your homes. And unlike the changing weather in Houston that has brought us hurricanes and snow and 70 degrees and it's just all over the board, God is never changing. And that is such a beautiful trait of his. And I have this morning a friend of mine, one of our core leaders, Robin Smith, who's going to share a great testimony about our unchanging God. So please welcome Robin. morning. Um, let me start with a quick word of prayer. Father, um, I just praise you and thank you for your amazing grace and that uh, you haven't failed yet and you won't start now. Um, just pray that the words of my mouth and the thoughts of my heart are pleasing in your sight this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so I thought we would start the morning off with just a little game um, where I'm going to read a fancified song title, and you're going to guess the real title. And since we were singing Christmas songs just a couple of weeks ago, uh, these are all going to be Christmas songs, okay? So here's the first one, the first fancified title, Nocturnal Time Span of Unbroken Quietness. Silent night, good. Okay, you got it. Embellish the interior passageway. Deck the halls. Okay, this one's a little tricky. Proceed forth, declaring upon a specific geological alpine formation. Yes, good. Thank you. So, <laughs> for several months now, um, an old hymn, which was written like around 1834, has repeatedly become into my mind. It's actually a very traditional and simple hymn, and it's based on a scripture that we studied in Matthew. And although that there's a new modern version of it, um, and it's great that we sing in our worship services often, it's the old one, the original to my childhood, um, that keeps, uh, God keeps coming to mind. And so I recently did a little looking into this song, and I discovered that though the title I know it by, that this hymn by, was not the original title, it actually has a very fancified original title, The Immutable Basis of a Sinner's Hope. So maybe immutable is not that fancified of a sound uh, word to you, but the first time that I encountered it, I had to go straight to the dictionary. It wasn't something um, that I knew, immutable. This is what the dictionary says, unchanging over time and or unable to be changed. And there are some synonyms, fixed, set, permanent, established, carved in stone, unchanging, unvarying, constant, firm, lasting, enduring, and steadfast. So the first time that I encountered Immutable was sometime around the fall of 2016. I read this book, uh, None Like Him, 10 Ways That God Is Different From Us and Why That's a Good Thing by Jen Wilkin. And the book focuses on 10 attributes of God and chapter six is immutable. And you can even see where I went and wrote the definition down because, like I said, I, it was not, I was not familiar with it. So I enjoyed this book a whole lot, and I put it aside, and I thought, ah, oh, this would be something to, great to read in the summertime when I have more time to chew on it. So for our vacation this past summer, we decided to rent a cabin on Lookout Mountain, 
and it straddles the Georgia and Tennessee lines, and it's minutes away from downtown Chattanooga, and has some really great uh, tourist attractions, Ruby Falls and Rock City. And Rock City was gonna be our main destination. And if you've never been there, it's really awesome, it has these incredible rocks that are the size of buildings, and there's like passageways that resemble streets, and they're all leading to um, the waterfall that's on the edge of uh, Lookout Mountain, and you can look out and see seven states. So the first morning of our vacation, I'm sitting on the porch with my incredible bluff view atop Lookout Mountain, a few miles from Rock City in my cabin that's named The Boulders, and I open my book to read the next chapter in this book, and it is chapter six, Immutable. The reason that this is significant is because we have learned that God's character and attributes are revealed by his names. And the name that proclaims God's unchanging, infinite sameness is the rock. Yes, sitting among the rocks, God is wanting to teach me about how he is the rock. So I needed to know and I needed to understand that God is the rock. He is immutable, unchanging. He is the God of infinite sameness. That morning I read, the scriptures speak of a God who does not change, like the tallest mountain peak on the horizon from generation to generation, God stands unchanging, immutable. The rock of our salvation endures, his character remains fixed, his plans remain steady, and his promises remain firm. So probably many of you have read scriptures, especially like in the Psalms, that talk about God as rock. Here's um, a few from Psalms. Psalm 18:2, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge. Psalm 61, 2, lead me to the rock that is higher than I, for you have been my refuge. And Psalm 95, 1, oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. And then that scripture in Matthew that we studied um, in chapter 7, verses 24 through 25. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on the house. But it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. There are many scriptures which talk about God's immutable character. Malachi 3, 6 says, uh, God declares, for I, the Lord, do not change. In James 1, 7, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. And then a personal favorite, Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. So why is God's immutable, unchanging nature so significant? Because my life, my circumstances, my world is in a constant state of change. But if God does not change, then I can rely on the unchanging truth of his word. Our great hope lies in him remaining exactly as who he says he is and doing exactly what he says he will do. When the rains of disappointment fall, he remains loving. When the floods of sorrow and grief come, he remains our refuge. And when the winds of struggle blow, he remains our salvation. Nothing can separate us from the unfailing, unchanging love of this great God, the rock of our salvation, upon which the house of our faith is built. So back to that fancified title that um, Edward Moat originally gave his song in 1834, The Immutable Basis of a Sinner's Hope. Well, let me read to you the lyrics which God keeps bringing to my mind in the midst of my current 
wind-tossed circumstances. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but I wholly lean on Jesus' name. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. His oath, his covenant, his blood, they support me in the whelming flood. And when all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. The immutable basis of this sinner's hope is the solid rock. Thank you so much, Robin. That was just beautiful, and I, we appreciate you sharing. You ladies are dismissed to your core groups. If today's your first day, please come up to the front. We want to have a few words with you. Good morning. Before we get going here this morning, um, I just want to remind you that next week we'll be starting in Volume 2 book. So if you do not yet have a second semester book, um, we have a few more up here, up in the front. You need to grab that or else you won't be doing your homework this week. And I know you all do your homework every week. So make sure you grab volume two. Our children today, they have a great lesson. Their lesson is about John the Baptist. Now we talked about John the Baptist today in our scripture um, Thankfully, our children are not learning that part of John the Baptist's life. Uh, they are learning about the earlier part of John the Baptist's life when he was sent um, to introduce and invite people to receive Jesus into their lives. And that's what our kids are learning, that they um, need to invite and receive Jesus in their lives. It's a great story. Sorry, I got a hair stuck on my lipstick here. Um, that's pretty, isn't it? Um, are we looking at the children? Oh, yes, we're looking at the children. <laughs> Sorry. Um, this has been a crazy week, right? I, I, who knows what day it is? I am just like so thrown off. Uh, it's so out of sorts. This has been a crazy week. My son is skiing up in Colorado, and it is actually colder here than it is where he is skiing, and that is crazy. I mean, something weird is going on, um, so, but it, it's just been fun as, as we've sat home, kind of confined to our houses, looking at some of the memes. Did y'all, have y'all seen some of the memes, you know, mocking us on our over-exaggeration? You know, did anybody go to H-E-B Monday night? That's what it looked like, people grabbing everything, and then we have the next one. I don't know if you can read that. At the top it says, Texas winter storm of the century, and then meanwhile in Canada, you know, they, that's for my Canadian friends. Um, they've got 20 feet of snow, and they keep going, right? They're driving through it. But there's a good reason why we Houstonians have hunkered down the last few days and didn't venture out. It's because we had ice, Right, and ice is totally different ball game than snow. Um, snow is fun and it's fluffy and it's relatively easy to drive in, but ice is a whole different animal. We got a picture. I went out yesterday and took a picture of my driveway, um, and this is the snow looks really pretty, right? But underneath that snow is a layer of ice that is going to send you down to the ground if you hit it, right? And so the ice was difficult to see, but that's why Houston shut down is because of the ice, not the snow. That's a metaphor for life. What's underneath that we don't focus on is sometimes more important than the pretty stuff that we see on top. A lot of us get attracted and we get caught up in the obvious things, the prominent things of life, and we miss what lies beneath. And so we need to understand that what lies beneath is very important. It's easy to lose sight of what should be the center of our focus. And that's what the center of our focus was this year, was the, oh, this week, was the ice, right? 
And so we need to make sure we look underneath and see what the center of the focus is. It's kind of like those pictures that they've been around for a while that you have to look, stare really hard. Sometimes they say, look kind of cross-eyed at it. You, I think we have one. Can you see that? Can you, do you see puppies in there? Okay, so y'all are good. So, but you have to kind of steer, and you get distracted by looking at everything else, all the other stuff. So we need to focus on what the main um, event is there, and that is what's underneath, and that's the puppies in this picture, but we need to make sure we see what lies beneath. And I think sometimes when we study scriptures that are familiar, like the familiar story today that we see of John the Baptist. It's death. We see the familiar scripture of feeding the 5,000. We see the familiar scripture of, um, of Peter walking on the water. It is easy for us to focus on those people and those events and not see what lies beneath. This morning, I hope we will all focus on what lies beneath all these stories, and that is Jesus and his great grace. Because you see, in reality, what lies beneath every sentence and every word of this entire book is Jesus and his great grace. So that's what we need to focus on this morning is what is underneath everything in these stories. So as we look at all these pictures, these different vignettes, these different um, stories that we'll look at this morning, I would ask you, what do you see when you read these? Do you see God's great grace. And then I would ask you to apply that to your life. Do you feel God's great grace in your life this morning? Let's pray. Father God, I just thank you so much that you give this these encouraging scriptures, these familiar stories, Father, that highlight who you are and the grace that you have bestowed on each one of us. Father, let us look beneath the surface this morning and see you in every word and in every passage. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so last week we looked at Jesus. He was teaching his disciples, um, and he was doing that in parables, some very confusing parables, right? But now he's finished with the parables, and he and his disciples have ventured back to Nazareth, which is where Jesus grew up. This was his hometown, okay? Luke's gospel tells us that earlier in Jesus' ministry, uh, Jesus had gone to Nazareth. He was rejected, okay? But now Jesus is going back for a second time to his hometown, and for a second time he'll be rejected. This will be the last time Jesus is ever in Nazareth. So as we look at this picture, this vignette, of Jesus going back to his hometown, we need to make sure we're not focusing on the people in the town, the Nazarenes there. We need to make sure we're focusing on Jesus because what this is a picture of is Jesus' great grace. He loved these people. They, I mean, these were his peeps. This is who he grew up with, right? And he loves these people, and he wants them to hear and understand the truth of who he is and his coming kingdom. So he gets there and he's teaching in the synagogues and scripture tells us that the people begin to question, where did he get this wisdom and these mighty works? In other words, they're saying, Jesus, we have known you your entire life. You are a carpenter's son. You have never had formal training in how to teach this kind of stuff. So who do you think you are standing there in the synagogue teaching like this? You were not trained like this. I remember... I went to a high school reunion several years ago. I am not the same person I was in high school. I hope some of you aren't either. Well, I don't know. Maybe you weren't like me. Anyway, I remember I was talking to an acquaintance who I hadn't seen since high school, and she said, Leslie, what are you doing these days? And I said, I teach a women's Bible study, and I thought she was going to choke on her bruschetta. She, you, you what? I mean, sometimes it's hard to go home. It's hard to go home sometimes. And that's what Jesus is finding out. You see, I, to me, I'm thinking that some of these guys, Jesus had played stickball with these kids, you know, when they're 10, 12 years old. They had joked together. I, can't, I imagine them having sleepovers together. And later, as Jesus got into his 20s, remember he was trained carpenter by his dad. I'm sure he made chairs and tables and benches and delivered them to their homes or their shops. So they know Jesus is a man. And when he comes 
claiming to be their king and their Messiah, that was just too much for them to take. They, they knew him as a man, and they couldn't see him any other way. But Jesus' great grace was extended to them because he loved them so much. But sadly, the scripture tells us that they were offended by him, and so he moved on. And so I, this is a place in scripture, and I think this scene, this last few verses there in chapter 13, is like almost an exclamation point that Matthew puts on that section. It's a fitting closing for him because he has just finished talking about all the growing um, objections to Jesus, the opposition and the hatred that is being formulated against Jesus. And so this story really just puts an exclamation point on how bad it is getting. And so now, starting in chapter 14 through chapter 20, Matthew will focus on something else. And he's going to focus on how Jesus is now going to intentionally begin withdrawing from the crowds. Okay, and he withdraws from the crowds basically for three reasons. Number one, because there is that opposition that is growing against him. And it's getting dangerous and his time is not here yet, so he needs to withdraw. Another reason he withdraws is because he and his disciples need rest. I mean, they're dog tired. And a third reason, probably most important reason, is he needs to finish training his disciples. He knows his time is limited and he's got to impart all these truths about his kingdom and who he is, and he needs to make sure they understand before he's gone. And so these next few chapters, we'll, be, we'll see him withdraw more and more and more. So as we open chapter 14, what we see is a story that on the surface looks like it's about Herod, Herod's evil wife, and their plot to kill John the Baptist. But when we look closer, when we look beneath the surface, we see that it's really a story about Jesus and his great grace. So let's look at the first two verses here. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard about the fame of Jesus, and he said to his servants, This is John the Baptist. He has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. So Matthew in this first verse, is revealing to us a big part of the puzzle that will fit into the events that are to come. And that big part of the puzzle is that, that Jesus is now on Herod's radar. Okay, Herod is now very much aware of Jesus and that he's in town and he's doing miracles. And so now Jesus has caught Herod's attention. And so Herod is aware of him. And so this is going to accelerate Jesus's earthly timetable now that he's on Herod's radar and this is another reason why it's very important that Jesus withdraw with his disciples and spend time alone with them teaching them okay so Jesus tells us um, that Herod hears that of Jesus's fame and he automatically superstitiously says oh my goodness this is the reincarnated John the Baptist, and he's come back to haunt me, okay? Now, the reason this is important is because Herod had murdered John the Baptist sometime earlier, okay? And so Matthew then gives us a flashback. This whole thing that he's talking about John the Baptist is a flashback. He's like, doo, 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 doo. go back in time, okay? Because he wants all the readers to understand where we are and how we got to where we are. So this is not happening in real time. This is a flashback to remind us what happened to John the Baptist, okay? So Herod is part of the Herodian dynasty. Um, the Herodian dynasty had a huge part in the life and death of Jesus. We first we saw the first Herod back when Jesus was born. That was Herod the Great. And Herod the Great um, was the same Herod. He was over all of Israel. He put out the edict that all the babies be killed. And that is why Joseph and Mary took Jesus and they went down to Egypt, right, to escape um, this evil plot. Okay, this is Herod the Great. Herod the Great dies. Joseph brings Jesus back up to Israel. Uh, but this is not the end of Herod's dynasty because Herod had three sons, all called Herod. <laughs> okay, The Herod we look at today, his full name is Herod Antipas. 
His title is Herod the Tetric, which means, Tetric means one-fourth, okay? So he is in charge of one-fourth of his daddy's kingdom, okay? So he doesn't have quite the power that his daddy had, okay? So Herod Antipas is a terrible guy. Um, He was married. His sister-in-law seduced him. He fell in love with his sister-in-law. So he divorces his wife. She divorces her husband. They get married, and they want to live happily ever after. But they're not setting a good example for Israel. So John the Baptist called them out on it. He called them on the carpet, and he said, you need to repent for what you're doing. And that didn't sit well with Herod, and it really didn't sit well with his wife, Herodias. So fast forward a little bit of time. It's the occasion of Herod's birthday. And Herodias has manipulated her 12 or 14-year-old daughter. This is so disgusting, y'all. 12 or 14-year-old daughter to do an erotic, seductive dance for her stepfather. Ugh. And not just for her stepfather. It's a birthday party. And back then, the, he would throw a party. There would be hundreds, maybe thousands of gross, drunk men in the room. Okay, this is just so beyond the pale. So she does this dance. It says Herod was pleased, and you, can, you would be correct in reading into that, what you are reading into that. And Mommy Dearest has gotten what she wants because the, Herod says, I'll give you anything you want. And so Mommy Dearest has already had the plot because she has been seething against John the Baptist. He's been in prison now 18 months. And she, finally, her time has come. And she's, she's going to seize on this opportunity, ask for John's head on a platter. Who does that? How gross is that? I mean, this is really twisted, y'all. Scripture says that Herod was sorry for what he had to do, but what's he going to do? I mean, he made an oath, right? You see, he was remorseful, but he was not repentant. And there is a very, very big difference between being remorseful and being repentant. So John the Baptist is murdered. There was no trial. There was no anything. He just flat out murdered him. And apparently John's murder has been haunting Herod ever since. And his conscience is so guilty that he had this guy killed that when he, in, back in verse 1, sees Jesus and becomes aware of Jesus' fame, he automatically thinks, oh my goodness, this, is, this guy is the reincarnated John the Baptist And he's here to haunt me because I had John the Baptist murdered. So instead of heeding his conscience, Herod will eventually determine that he will do the same thing to Jesus that he did to John the Baptist, and he'll just kill him. So we move on to verse 13. Now, when John heard this, or when Jesus heard this, he withdrew um, from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. But when the crowd heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. So it says, when Jesus heard this. What did Jesus hear? Number one, he heard about John's death, so he was withdrawing because of that. But I think also, you go back to verse one, when Jesus heard that he was now on Herod's radar, that's when he decided to withdraw and to get away and to kind of lay low for a while. Now we need to go over, we're going to do a lot of cross-referencing with some other gospels this morning to get a fuller picture here. And so we need to go over to Mark's gospel, Mark chapter 6, verse 30 through 32. This is them leaving to go away to withdraw. It says, verse 30, the apostles returned to Jesus and told him all they had done and taught. Now, this was confusing. I'm, uh, okay, this is the same event. What are, you, what are they returning from? What we know, they have, smart people have figured this out. If you go back to chapter 10, when Jesus was commissioning his disciples, he actually at that time sent them out, like in, in pairs, uh, missionary teams, pairs. And they went out and they were healing and they were preaching and teaching. And now they have come back to Jesus and that's where we find them right now. So they've come back, and verse, picking up in verse 31 of Mark, and he said to them, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while, for many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And when they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. So we see that 
they're not by themselves individually. It is Jesus and his disciples getting away. It reminded me, I, I kept hearing the ding. Want to get away? Ding. You know, Southwest commercial. Want to get away? Ding. They needed to get away. They not only wanted to get away, they needed to get away for some rest. So they're all in the boat, and they're a little bit off the shoreline, and the crowds are just coming. And they're on the shore, and they're seeing the boat out there, and they can see the trajectory of the boat, and they see where it's going to come on shore. And the scripture actually says the people on the shore are already there when Jesus lands his boat, okay? So they get there, they're dog tired, and this is just such a beautiful picture of God's grace. Remember, we're not focusing on the people on the shore or feeding the hungry. We're focusing on God's grace here. And he's exhausted, and the boat pulls up, and there's all these people there. Does Jesus say, you know what? Sorry, guys, can't help you. This is me time. I'm taking a little vacay. I need to rest. I need to refuel. Absolutely not. He's not aggravated with the crowds. He sees and looks at these people with compassion, and he meets the needs of the crowd. What a sermon he was preaching to his disciples. What a sermon he is preaching to each one of us this morning. I don't know about y'all, but there are so many times where I have been dog tired. I have needed rest. I have been exhausted. I had problems of my own, and the phone rings, or the knock at a door, and someone needs help. And I just look, Lord, are you kidding me? I need rest. You need to send them away. Jesus' example here is that he never sent someone away who was hungry. And I think we need to learn from that example. Scripture says that there were 5,000 men in the crowd, which means that there were upwards of probably 10,000 people. So this is a massive, massive crowd of people. And they know it's getting late. It's not a little McDonald's to drive through because they're out in the middle of nowhere, right? So there's no food. There's no nothing. And the only solution that the, that the disciples can come up with is, hey, Jesus, you just got to send them away. That's all there is to it. You got to send them away. And again, the disciples do what I am so guilty of doing so many times, looking at my circumstances and thinking pragmatically, how am I going to fix this problem? And what Jesus is teaching is that you aren't going to fix the problem. You need to rely on me to supply the needs. Jesus looks at his disciples and he says, you need to give them something to eat. And if we look over at Mark's gospel, we find out a little bit more about the disciples. Over in Mark 6, it says, And the disciples said to him, Shall we go buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? They're still thinking pragmatically. Okay, we got to go buy food, I guess. I don't know where we'll go. We're, you know, but they're thinking pragmatically. And Jesus wants them to realize that they are, they are, are never going to be able to, in their own flesh, meet the needs of feeding the bread of life to people. He wants them to understand that you need to, here's how you solve the problem, guys. You bring me everything you've got. And Luke's gospel tells us that they had five loaves and two fishes. Bring me everything you've got, and you watch how my great grace will supply in abundance everything that you need. It's just a beautiful picture of grace there, isn't it? This massive crowd, it says they ate, and when they finished eating, they were satisfied. So it's not they didn't just nibble. I mean, they ate. They were satisfied. They had a full meal. And after that, there were 12 baskets left over. Now that is God abundantly and graciously providing for the crowds. One theologian did a study of the basket there. There are 12 baskets, one for each disciple, right? And as this one theologian did a study of the word basket, he found that that word basket wasn't a small little basket. 
it was like a hamper size basket. So if that is true, I just love this story all the more. I can see these disciples who were like, we don't know how you're going to do this, God. And every one of them has to carry this huge basket of food away because God has abundantly met their needs. And so they're carrying it away. Okay, God, I get it. I get it. But did they get it? Did they get it? Verse 22. Immediately he made the disciples get in the boat and go before him on the other side while he dismissed the crowds. John's Gospel, chapter 6, gives us a little bit more info here. It says, When the people saw the sign that Jesus had done, they said, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. So the people in the crowds had been physically fed, and they are about to come and drag Jesus to Jerusalem and make him be the king. That was their plan, but this was not God's will. This is not what God wanted. They were not doing this out of spiritual motives. This was, again, trying to suppress Rome, and they're, so their motives weren't right. And I think maybe Jesus is getting the disciples out of there because he knows if they stay in this atmosphere, all this fervor, excitement about taking Jesus to make him king, they might get caught up in that, right? So it says he, Jesus made them get out in the boat and go away. So Jesus dismisses the crowd and he goes up and he prays. And I just love this part because I wish I could spend more time on prayer. We'll get to this later as we go through the chapter, but this is such an port, important part of who Jesus is. And if Jesus, who was the perfect, eternal Son of God, found it necessary to withdraw from the chaos and hectic, busy, daily life and be alone with his Father, how much more important is it that you and I do the same? So while Jesus is praying, the disciples are out there struggling in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. And they're once again in the middle of a storm, and it's Jesus who put them there. Jesus put them in the storm. And so there's... This is an important thing that we need to learn about storms. There's two kinds of storms in the Bible. There's a storm of correction when Jesus disciplines us, when God disciplines us. And there's a storm of perfection when God grows us. Now, a storm of correction would be Jonah. Remember Jonah and the whale. He disobeyed God. He did not obey what God asked him to do. And so that storm was a storm intended to correct something in Jonah. These guys, they did everything. They were right where God called them to be. They were obeying God, but they're still in a storm. But this storm is for the purpose of growing their faith. And I think a lot of times we as believers think that, okay, if I'm in God's will, if I'm obeying God, if I'm walking with him, then I'm going to have smooth sailing in my life. And that is just not true. God says in this life, you will have trouble. So when we are in one of those storms of perfection, we need to understand that it was God that brought us into that storm, and he's going to protect us while we're there, okay? So the disciples, they've been, the scholars think they've been out there rowing maybe eight, nine hours, about two, or between three and six in the morning, they are exhausted, y'all. And all of a sudden, they see someone walking toward them on the water, and they think it's a ghost. Uh, Matthew, verse 27. But immediately, Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. That word there, I wish I could spend a long time on this, too. That word there, it is I, or that phrase, it is I. The Greek translation for that is, I am and you may be familiar with I am. John's gospel gives, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I am the gate. I am uh, the living water. Uh, and so it also reminds us and takes us back to Exodus when God speaks to Moses through the burning bush. And Moses says, who are you? And he says, I am who I am. So what Jesus is doing here is he is saying, I am the great I am. He is claiming his deity right here. On the water, okay? Verse 28. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come out onto the water. And Jesus said, come. So Peter came out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. 
And when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. I think a lot of people um, give Peter a bad rap here because he took his eyes off of Jesus and he began to sink. But I give him a lot of credit because there were 11 other disciples that were sitting in the back of the boat. And I would be sitting right there with them. At least Matthew had, or Peter had the little bit of faith to step out of that boat and go to Jesus. And so he was keeping his eyes on Jesus there until he didn't. I love this quote. It says, if we gaze upon the Lord, the bigger and mightier he becomes and the smaller our circumstances then become. However, if we gaze upon our circumstances, they become bigger and mightier and the Lord becomes smaller and smaller. And that's exactly what happened. When he took his eyes off of Jesus and he focused on his circumstances, he began to sink. And when he sank, he cried out. And that cry, I don't think it was a cry of faith. I think it was a cry of fear. He was fearful in that moment. And how did Jesus respond to Peter's fear? Did he hold him under and say, don't you ever doubt me again? Absolutely not. He reaches down with his hand and his saving grace rescues Peter in his time of need. That encourages me because there's a lot of times where we are so overwhelmed and our faith is shot and all we can do is cry out in fear. And Jesus will answer us in our moment of fear and he will save us. This story is not a story about Peter and his faith or lack thereof. This story is a story about Jesus' saving grace. Like the picture that we stare at of the puppies that were up there, the pictures that we stare at till we're cross-eyed so we can see the picture within a picture. We need to make sure that we are focusing on what lies beneath each one of these amazing stories. And that is Jesus' saving grace. Did you see his saving grace in today's text? Do you feel his saving grace in your life this morning? Let's pray. Father God, I just thank you for who you are. We thank you for your saving grace that you have given to each one of us. Father, let us be people who recognize it and embrace it and share it with others. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.